students welcome back to physics class so till last class we have studied the optoelectronic devices under optoelectronic devices we have studied the photovoltaic cell and then light emitting diode that is led and the third one is solar cell okay so the lesson is over zener diode is deleted from the portions as well as the transistors okay now we are going to see the book example look at the question the vi characteristics of a silicon diode which diode silicon diode the vi characteristics of a silicon diode is shown in the graph and you are going to calculate the resistance of the diode in this two cases one is the diode when diode current is 15 milliampere what is the resistance similarly when the diode voltage is in minus 10 voltage what is the resistance so here the diode current it is in the forward bias and the diode voltage it is in the reverse bias okay so we are going to determine the resistance in two cases one is under forward bias another one is under reverse bias now look at the graph so this is a graph given uh, for iv characteristics of a silicon diode you can notice that to apply voltage gradually from zero there is no much change in the current but suddenly after 0.5 applied voltage the current started to increase the drastic changes found from 0.7 to 0.8 so there is a point of applied voltage in which the current rapidly increases is called what is the name of the voltage threshold voltage so it is from 0.7 and 0.8 you can notice that in this graph 0.7 to 0.8 it is linear almost it is linear so the diode current is 15 milliampere so the 15 milliampere is here so the 15 milliampere is between 10 milliampere to 20 milliampere so between 10 milliampere to 20 milliampere between 10 milliampere to 20 milliampere the graph is straight line how the graph looks straight line okay so between um, 10 milliampere to 15 milliampere the graph is straight line so in this case we can determine the resistance in forward bias this is for forward bias so we can determine the resistance so already we know the resistance in the forward bias so the resistance in forward bias is equal to ratio between change in the applied voltage by change in the current what is the change in the applied vo voltage from 10 to 20 milliampere it is 0.8 uh, 0.7 to 0.8 so 0.8 voltage to 0.7 voltage divided by 20 milliampere to 10 milliampere so 20 milliampere to 10 milliampere which is equal to 0.1 voltage divided by 10 milliampere so we can write this as 0.1 as 1 by 10 and uh, already we have a 10 and the denominator milli goes to there we'll get 10 power 3 and uh, voltage by ampere that is equal to resistance ohm so it is n q into 10 power 1 into 10 power 1 it is a 10 square law so that goes to numerator 10 power minus 2 ohm therefore the resistance is 10 ohm so in forward bias we found the resistance so the resistance in the forward bias which is equal to 10 ohm okay it is between the two value in that they given when the current is 15 milliampere what is the resistance because between the two range the 15 milliampere is there so the current remains unchanged the next we are going to find the resistance in the reverse bias in the reverse bias case the resistance in the reverse bias which is equal to ratio between change in applied voltage by change in the current okay so they given already when the voltage is minus 10 when the voltage is minus 10 volt and the corresponding current is to be minus 1 microampere 
Okay. So already they given the value directly you can substitute minus 10 voltage divided by minus 1 micro ampere. So minus minus cancel away and what we will get 10 divided by 10 power minus 6 volt by ampere which is equal to 10 into 10 power plus 6 the volt per ampere become the ohm. So the final answer is 10 power 7 ohm. So this is the answer for the resistance in the reverse bias. So you can compare the two value in reverse bias. In a reverse bias, the resistance is 10 power 7 ohm. Okay. So this is a reverse bias resistance. This is a forward bias resistance. So already we know this uh, silicon diode can be operated only one cases, mostly in forward bias. So in a forward bias alone, the silicon diode allows the current in one direction. And uh, the resistance in the forward bias is always less than the resistance in reverse bias. Since the forward bias case, the diode offers high current to flow. So therefore, we can come to the conclusion that the reverse bias resistance is much, much greater than the forward bias resistance. Coming to the next question. Look at the question number 6. The current in forward bias is known to be more. Already we have seen the graph. The forward bias current is more. It's mostly measured up to milli ampere. Then the current in the reverse bias. The reverse bias current is measured in micro ampere. Then what is the reason then to operate the photodiodes in reverse bias? We have studied already the photodiodes. The photodiode is nothing but a specially fabricated PN junction diode that operated under reverse bias. Then what is the reason then to operate the photodiodes in reverse bias? Listen. Look at the solution. Let's in a p-tech semiconductor or n-tech semiconductor. What is the majority charge carrier? Electrons. In n-tech semiconductor, the majority charge carriers are electrons. Whereas the minority carriers are holes. Minority carriers are holes. Okay. So let the majority charge carrier as um, N and the minority charge carrier as P. Okay. And let delta N comma delta P as Excess electrons and holes. Excess electrons and holes when there is no illumination. What is called illumination? The light is falling on the diode which produces the current. Yes. When there is no illumination. And then we know the electron hole concentrations. Then the electron hole concentration concentrations are what are the electron hole concentrations? It is N dash the ele electron concentration that is majority charge carriers plus fractional change in it, not fractional change that excess uh, excess electrons in it. Similarly, the hole concentration is the sum of minority charge carriers and excess holes. So this is under which case when there is no when there is no illumination. So this is under when there is no illumination. So now we can determine easily the fractional change in the electrons as well as the fractional change in the minority charge carrier. Therefore, the fractional change in majority charge carriers is we are determined. Also, we are determined the fractional change in the uh, minority charge carriers. Fractional change in the minority charge carriers. But the fractional change in the majority charge carrier is very, very less than the fractional change in the minority charge carrier which means which is dominating the minority charge carriers are dominating under reverse bias. So hence 
the minority charge carriers what is the minority charge carriers that is holes that is holes are dominating under reverse bias so look at the question we know that um the current in forward bias is known to be more than the current in reverse bias but why the photodiodes are operated under uh, reverse bias the reason only we are going to find this is the reason so mainly start from here basically in nth semiconductors the electrons are the majority charge carriers and holes are the minority charge carriers when there is no elimination let us consider delta n and delta v are the excess electrons and excess holes okay so we should find the electron hole concentration under equilibrium no so in this situations the electron concentration is the sum of majority charge carriers and excess electron similarly the hole concentration is the sum of holes that is the minority charge carriers and excess holes so this is under the case when there is no elimination okay now we are going to find the fractional change fractional change in the majority carrier and fractional change in the minority carrier repeat again fractional change in the majority carrier fractional change in the minority carrier but in the cases the fractional change in the minority carriers are more than the fractional change in the majority charge carriers this is possible only under reverse bias so the photodiodes can be operated in a reverse bias book exercise actually the first five question is numericals that already uh, you can answer very easily it is left mcq only so go through those topics and get the answers now we are going to solve the other questions that is question number 8 and question number 11 first look at the book exercise question number 8 in half wave rectification what is the output frequency if the input frequency is 50 hertz actually two divisions are there suppose what is the output frequency of a full wave rectifier for the same input so first we'll solve that we know half wave rectification we are giving the alternating current to as a input but the output is only the half wave am i right so in this case the frequency does not change already i said uh, in the rectifier conditions so in the cases the output frequency which is always equal to input frequency so already they mentioned uh input uh, input frequency okay so input frequency is no change it is 50 hertz they are asking only the output frequency so for half wave rectification the output frequency is equal to input frequency therefore they are asking about the output frequency so output frequency is equal to 50 hertz now this one we given as a input to a full wave rectifier then what would be the output okay in the cases that input frequency is 50 hertz then what would be the output frequency what would be the output frequency that is a case no yes so in the cases also we are known that the output frequency is equal to double of the input frequency okay already um the input frequency is nothing but 50 hertz so 2 into 50 hertz which is equal to 100 hertz therefore from a full wave rectifier the output frequency is equal to double the input input frequency okay moving to the next question a pn photodiode is fabricated from a semiconductor with a band gap of 2.8 electron volt can it direct a wavelength of 6000 nanometer by seeing this itself you can find that mostly visible light particularly the high frequency light only it can direct but the wavelength is high so by seeing this value itself you can confirm but we should solve so how to get the solution listen so already we know the energy of the incident photon we should find so e is equal to 
H nu. H is the Planck's constant. Nu is the frequency of incident light. But instead of frequency, they given the wavelength. So we know that C is equal to nu lambda. Therefore, nu is equal to C by lambda. Substitute. Instead of frequency, speed of light by the wavelength of light. Now directly you can substitute all the value. Planck's constant is 6.62 into 10 to the power minus 34 joules second into speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second divided by the wavelength is 6000 nanometer. Nano means 10 to the power minus 9. So joules second meter per second divided by meter. So meter meter second second cancel. Okay. So after the simplification the answer is we can write like this 6.62 into t divided by 6 into 10 to the power minus 34 plus 8 here on t here on minus 9 so minus 6 that become a plus 6 so the final answer would be in joule yes so which is equal to 2.1 into 10 to the power minus uh, no this is not the value which is equal to 3.31 into 10 to the power minus 20 joule. But in this case, the energy value should be represented in electron volt, but we got in joule. So we are going to convert from joule into electron volt. For that, what will you do? 3.31 into 10 to the power minus 20, 1 joule. That is 1 electron volt is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power, since we know the value. One, joule, uh, 1 electron volt is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule. No, that, uh, therefore 1 joule is equal to 1 by 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 electron volt. Yes, to convert the joule into electron volt, we need to divide 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 electron volt. So, which is equal to 2.1 into 10 to the power minus 1 electron volt or which is equal to 0 0.21 electron volt. So this is um, the energy of incident photon. This is the energy of incident photon. We know the rule already. For a photodiode, the energy of incident photon should be greater than the energy of uh, the energy gap value. So this is a condition, but we are received it is less the energy of incident photon is 0 0.21 electron volt that value are going to compare with the band gap energy band gap energy band gap is 2.8 electron volt basically the incident photon energy should be greater but here it is less so can it detect no it cannot detect it cannot uh, detect the wavelength of 6000 nanometer so due to this no, it cannot detect. Okay. I hope you are very clear. Once again, look at the questions. For a PN junction diode fabricated from a semiconductor with the band gap is given, from that uh, can detect the wavelength of 6000 nanometer we want to find. Okay. So the energy of the incident photon is equal to H nu, but nu is, is equal to speed of the light by the wavelength. So substitute the speed of light and the wavelength and uh, after the simplification we get the energy value in joule but it could be converted into electron volt. So we are going to convert from joule into electron volt then finally we will receive the value. The measured value is less than the energy gap value so it cannot detect the wavelength. So this question, this is additional exercise, question number 12. The number of silicon atoms per meter cube is 5 into 10 to the power 28. Okay. This is doped simultaneously with the 5 into 10 to the power 22 atoms per meter cube of arsenic and 5 into 10 to the power 20 per meter cube atoms of indium. Okay. We are going to calculate the number of electrons and the holes. They given the uh, carrier concentration at equilibrium. From that, you are going to predict the material is P type or N type. So how are we going to solve? Listen. So already they given the silicon atoms. Listen. This is the silicon atoms. 
the silicon atoms how many, in the silicon in the silicon uh, type how many atoms are there per meter cube so per meter cube in a silicon it is 5 into 10 to the power 28 atoms are there so this is doped simultaneously with the 5 into 10 to the power 22 atoms of arsenic and 5 into 10 to the power 20 per meter cube of indium okay so from that we are going to calculate how many electrons and how many holes from that that type are you clear it's a very simple question they given the silicon atom so per meter cube for a silicon type semiconductor how many atoms are there in the simultaneously they are doping arsenic and indium with the numbers from that you are going to calculate the electrons and the holes based on the number of electrons and the holes are produced in that cases we are going to predict whether the doped material is the p type or n type okay so the solution is first you write the given data so what they given number of silicon atoms per meter cube is 5 into 10 to the power 28 similarly number of dopant that is arsenic number of arsenic is arsenic per meter cube number of arsenic per meter cube is 5 into 10 to the power 22 and number of indium per meter cube is 5 into 10 to the power 20 also they given a carry in, in, in intrinsic uh, concentration under equilibrium it is 1.5 into 10 to the power 16 per meter cube okay so we know that for finding the number of electrons it is equal to number of atoms in arsenic minus number of intrinsic concentration so directly you can subtract so the number of atoms in arsenic is 5 into 10 to the power 22 minus 1.5 into 10 to the power 16 which is equal to take subtractions you will get approximately 4.9 into 10 to the power 22 so this is for electron number of electrons okay similarly uh, under equilibrium at equilibrium we know that the product of number of electrons and number of holes is equal to n i square okay so already we found the electron numbers now we are going to find the number of holes therefore number of holes is equal to n i square by n e f so substitute the value n i square is 1.5 into 10 to the power 16 the whole square divided by number of electrons we found it is 4.9 into 10 to the power 22 so after the simplification finally we will get the number of holes which is 4.51 into 10 to the power 9 so this is for holes so we found the electrons as well as the holes now you compare the number of electrons and number of holes which is greater number of electrons are more in number than the number of holes so number of electrons are much more in the number of holes that is 4.9 into 10 to the power 22 is much much greater than 4.51 into 10 to the power 9 if electrons are majority charge carriers then the material after doping is to be n type if electrons are majority carriers then the material is
n type so finally we confirm the material is n type i repeat once again silicon atoms are given and from the silicon atoms simultaneously they are doping the arsenic with some numbers and indium with some numbers with the uh, intrinsic at, under equilibrium so from that we are going to determine the number of electrons so number of electrons is the difference in number of arsenic and a number of um, intrinsic so from that we can get the electron number already we know under equilibrium the product of the number of electrons and the holes which is equal to the square of the carrier intrinsic concentration so the number of hole is equal to the electron number will be in the denominator in the right hand side yes after substituting and simplifying we got the number of holes compare the both number of electrons are more number comparing to the number of holes so the material would be n type